When it comes to the depiction of the most dramatic yet poetically important events of the past throughout the most flawlessly realistic art, Paul de la Roche is one of the first names that comes to mind. Known for his attention to detail, dedication toward research before painting, and his love for dramatic lighting to emphasize details, de la Roche created many masterpieces and one of the most historically significant has to be the execution of Lady Jane Grey. What is it about? Who is Lady Jane Grey? What's the story behind the painting? What's the political significance of the event that the execution of Lady Jane Grey ended up being one of the most famous artworks of De La Roche? You're at the right place if you have all these questions, because we're going to discuss everything in today's video. So let's get started. As we can tell by the name, the painting is about the execution of Lady Jane Grey. Completed by Paul De La Roche in 1833, this might be one of his most famous artworks. But the question remains, who was Lady Jane Grey? To answer simply, she was the Queen of England for nine days before it all went downhill from there and ended up with her being executed. Sounds a bit too dramatic to be true, doesn't it? Don't worry folks, you'll know pretty much everything about the painting by the end of today's video. Once again, let's step back and just notice the main parts of the painting. At first, of course, we see a fair-skinned lady, dressed in the simplest and most innocent white dress with no jewelry or accessories. In front of her, there's a wooden black block and you can guess how she was executed, by being beheaded. Under her striking white dress, a velvet cushion can be seen for support, and under the wooden block, we can see a pile of straw which is meant to absorb the blood shooting out of the blood vessels of the execution once the axe does what it's supposed to do. Besides the young lady in the center, we see a man on the right who seems to be guiding her toward the cushion and the wooden block, preparing her for execution. According to interpreters, that man is Sir Thomas Bridges, the lieutenant of the tower who was responsible for managing the entire execution. Another man can be seen standing with an axe, waiting for her to get into position. If you look at his expression, you can tell he's well aware that this is not just any lady about to get beheaded. The slightly furrowed eyebrows indicate that he's attentive or even pitiful and sympathetic towards Lady Jane Grey. Now, let's take a look at the left side of the painting. Behind Jane, the blindfolded girl, we can see another girl standing with her face toward the pillar, refusing to watch the execution, while another girl sits there with her eyes closed, seemingly unconscious. As we mentioned, Lady Jane was the queen of her land, even if it was only for nine days. So for her to be executed in plain white underclothes while another unconscious girl lays there, wearing a beautifully vibrant dress is very interesting and thought-provoking. At the right edge of the painting, we can see the black cloth that's covering the entire floor push back a little. But why? There's no one near it that could do that. Well, one thing about Paul de la Roche is every single detail of his painting holds a particular meaning. In this case, if you pay attention to the naked wooden floor that's exposed to sight, you can see his signature and date on it. And how lovely is it that instead of plainly signing the painting to claim ownership, De La Roche painted it as if it's been carved into the wooden stage, and revealed purposefully, as if it's his show, his drama, his story to narrate. In fact, the entire painting looks like it was a stage show that had the audience to witness and be aware of what would happen if they did what Lady Jane Grey did. But wait. What did Lady Jane Grey do that got her executed? As we all know, Paul de la Roche was famous for his artwork being strongly related to important political or historical events. The rise and fall of kings, the cunning lies and tricks overthrowing thrones and the seemingly untouchable power of the crown was all depicted masterfully through his paintings. And this piece in particular was about Lady Jane Grey, King Edward VI's cousin. After he died in 1553, there was a lot of conflict over who should be his successor. And of course, since we're talking about the royal family, there's a lot of conspiracies, planning, manipulation, and brainwashing involved. So even though the late king had stepsisters who were perfectly eligible to take the throne after him, none of them actually got crowned. But what does all that have to do with Lady Jane Grey? The later executed queen was married to Guilford Dudley. Their wedding was arranged by the groom's father and the Duke of Northumberland, John Dudley. Surprised? Usually known for the concerningly frequent practice of incest and pretty much marrying siblings just so the crown stays in the family, the British royals went out of their way this time. If it wasn't for Guilford Dudley, Edward would have been Lady Grey's husband. Anyways, 
Besides young Dudley's presence, another big reason why Jane didn't marry King Edward VI was because the king was suffering from tuberculosis and everyone assumed that he was very close to dying. And if, by chance, you've been keeping up with the Netflix series The Crown, you'd know what happens as soon as the person in power gets sick. The entire family starts campaigning or conspiring for secession, if it's not that bad. Otherwise, it just ends in the good old-fashioned way, bloodshed. In King Edward's case, it didn't end in bloodshed. Lady Jane was presented as the perfect option to pass his crown on as she was related to the king and, unlike his half-sisters, she was Protestant. Her in-laws were what a lot of people would call hungry for power, and using their daughter-in-law for the crown seemed to be the best option and they've even got successful. As tuberculosis hollowed King Edward VI from the inside, Lady Jane's father-in-law, John Dudley, brainwashed him from the outside. And let's just say that he was good at it and the king ended up ignoring his own half-sister, Mary, who was perfectly eligible for the crown despite the fact that she was a pacifist and made Lady Jane his successor. But her reign lasted only for nine days as Mary became the public and the royal's council preference for leadership. And when the war started, John Dudley couldn't prove to be half as good as his brainwashing and ended up getting imprisoned and executed by the rightful heir to the throne. Jane, however, was innocent in all of this and already reluctant in becoming Edward VI's successor, so Mary spared her and her husband. Everyone, even her opponent Mary knew that Jane was kind, intelligent, and graceful, so killing her seemed wrongful. But the men in Jane's life and their lust for power ended up getting her executed, even if the new heir, Mary, wasn't willing to. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. After her father-in-law's hunger for power got her in the verge of getting executed and somehow survived due to Tudor's kindness, her father decided to pick up where John Dudley stopped. Her father, Henry Gray, invoked rebellion against the king and not only was that unsuccessful but it also made things worse for everyone. All the people who had survived the previous battle between Mary and Dudley ended up getting executed. The enraged queen refused to show mercy for the second time and decided to execute every single person she saw as a threat. And that included the young and innocent Lady Jane Grey as well. The former queen was executed on February 12, 1554 at the age of 16 or 17 years old. After Lady Jane got executed, a lot of people considered it as a religious execution as she was Protestant while Queen Tudor was a pacifier. The English Reformation, which had begun under Henry VIII, was a major factor in these conflicts. Not only that, but Lady Jane's execution also strengthened Queen Tudor's hold and served as a lesson for anyone else who was even slightly interested in rebellion. A lot of the details and the slight contrast between reality and the painting are very thought-provoking. For example, normally the person who is about to be executed has their hair tied, but Jane's fiery red mane is loose, probably to emphasize her identity. Also, the fact that Jane chose to have a public execution while the painting depicts the entire process took place behind closed doors is intriguing. It's almost as if De La Rouche wanted someone to see it for what it was, a show of power, so that no one else would dare rebel against the crown. We can also observe minute details in the posture of every character. For example, the helplessness and surrender depicted in Jane's body language is very readable. Her outreached arms and tired expression as a seemingly fatherly and affectionate figure guides her. He narrates her life in a very ironically accurate way. For the depiction of Jane, Delaroche used his beloved Mademoiselle Anais for inspiration and the painting was exhibited in the Paris Salon in 1834. Initially thought to be destroyed by the Thames flood, it was rediscovered in the Tate Gallery basement. And since 1868, one of Paul De La Roche's most famous art pieces, The Execution of Lady Jane Grey, has been on display in the National Gallery. And while well, on that note, we must end today's video. So click on any of the four videos on your screen now.